Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be discussing some of the new discoveries in regards to helium. That other gas that's just as important as hydrogen when it comes to studying cosmology and when it comes to studying the universe. But in this case we're talking about this relatively recent study that discovers primordial helium here on Earth and calculates how much of it there is inside planet Earth. In the process, proving something really important about the formation of our planet. And so let's discuss this in a little bit more detail, but first let's start with the idea of helium and how it's not really just one single thing. There are different types of helium, or to be more exact, there are different isotopes of helium, nine to be more specific, and two of them are stable, they can exist for as long as the universe can exist. Today they're known as helium-3 and helium-4. Now, the helium that's familiar to all of us, the one used in balloons for example, or the one that you sometimes hear in the news is becoming more scarce, becoming more expensive, and is slowly escaping into outer space from our planet, is helium-4. That's the most abundant helium type on our planet, and it's also the type of helium that's most used in various industries and a lot of different types of manufacturing. It's also the type of helium that becomes what's known as a superfluid when cooled down to extreme temperatures. In this case, it starts to behave using various quantum properties, with the fluid literally being able to escape any container. And at the same time, it also becomes what's known as a boson. But that's beside the point. The point here is that this helium is different from what's known as helium-3, sometimes known as the primordial helium because that's the helium that most likely was created during the Big Bang in the beginning of the universe. And unlike helium-4, helium-3 is pretty much a completely different element. First of all, it's the only element known to us that's stable and that has more protons than neutrons. Second of all, it's extremely rare on our planet. The vast majority of helium-3 on our planet came from the Big Bang, came from the essentially the beginning of the universe. And it's also extremely rare on our planet. Of all of the helium on our planet, only 0.0001% is helium-3. Everything else is helium-4. And that's mostly because of how these different elements are made on our planet and how they are replenished with time. Apart from the original helium-3 from the beginning of the universe, a very small amount of it is also produced through the interaction of lithium that you see right here with a lot of natural neutrons coming from outer space or from planet Earth, with other small amounts being created during the so-called atomic age when a lot of different atomic bombs were tested in the atmosphere. But the production of helium-4 is different, it's produced by any type of alpha decay or any kind of a radioactivity where an alpha particle emerges when some kind of a radioactive element decays. And so all kinds of radioactive elements inside our planet produce helium-4. And eventually it makes its way to the surface, although sometimes it stays mixed with a lot of other gases, until someone goes and tries to mine those gases. So most of the helium-4 today is actually a byproduct of natural gas extraction. And as a result of all of this, there is so much more helium-4 compared to helium-3 on our planet if you were to compare it to a typical gas cloud somewhere out there in our galaxy. A typical cosmic cloud or a typical molecular cloud would actually contain much higher concentrations of helium-3 to helium-4 because of the way these two different isotopes are generated. So helium-3 levels in outer space are way, way higher. But in terms of usability for future technologies, it's really always been about helium-3. And there's a really important reason for this. A lot of theories predicted that by mixing helium-3 with deuterium, and by placing all of this in a typical fusion reactor with very high temperatures on the inside, it might become possible to create a source of extremely efficient and relatively safe energy, fusion energy. And in this case, helium-3 plus deuterium provides the best source. It's actually better than anything else we've ever studied or anything else we have. And in this case, it would produce the highest amount of energy and would produce almost no dangerous radiation at all making helium-3 potentially one of the most important gases on the planet, assuming of course fusion technology becomes a reality. Now we're actually going to discuss some of the new discoveries in regards to fusion in one of the future videos, so make sure to subscribe, but there's also another video somewhere right there or in the description that discusses some of the recent achievements. Either way though, fusion is extremely important and the ideas of fusion, almost all of them, rely on efficiency. 
And in this case, helium-3 atoms represent the most efficient types of fusion we can ever expect to achieve, but at the same time its rarity represents the major problem with this element. There is very little of helium-3 on our planet, and the majority of the element is actually trapped inside. And every year very little of it escapes, approximately 2 kilograms per year usually seeps through various cracks here and there. And so because it's so rare on our planet, it's really only been used in very tiny minute amounts in various research and nothing else. It's almost impossible to make this practical. But that's of course until the scientists realize that there is a deposit of helium-3 somewhere nearby. A tremendous amount of helium-3 is deposited on the surface of the moon by our sun. And that's because the nuclear reactions inside the sun also create helium-3 as a result. And all this helium-3 at some point makes its way to the surface of the moon and gets deposited in various locations as you see in this image right here. And so there's actually at least a thousand times more helium-3 on average on the surface of the moon compared to the surface of planet Earth. And it's still rare, but there's way more of it in certain locations. In terms of the actual numbers, some of the highest concentration of helium-3 on the surface here is approximately 4 parts per billion. That's pretty low. On Earth though it's even lower. It's about 5 parts per trillion in our atmosphere. Making this one of the rarest elements on the planet. But it's still an important element for other reasons, specifically understanding the universe and also understanding the origin of our planet. And so this recent study kind of investigated that. They wanted to figure out how much of helium-3 there is inside a planet, how it's being exchanged, and what all of this means for the origins of our planet in regards to the formation of the solar system. And so by doing a relatively thorough analysis of the structure of our planet, and by trying to figure out how much of helium-3 escapes the planet from the surface, in this study the scientists determined that the majority of helium-3 from the origins of the universe are very likely stuck inside the core of our planet. And through the process of convection and interaction of different layers inside our planet, some of the helium eventually escapes from the core, makes its way to the mantle, and then makes its way to the crust, escaping the planet at some point. With roughly around 2 kilograms, as I mentioned before, escaping every single year. And that's not a lot. But it also means that if we were to combine all of the helium-3 inside the planet into one large chunk, it would be roughly around 1 billion tons in mass equivalent to about 200 pyramids of Giza in weight. Now all of this is of course based on modeling and mostly different calculations, so it's not actual measurements, but if correct, these measurements suggest only one thing about the origin of our planet. It suggests that Earth had to form inside a very deep region of solar nebula, or inside the thicker part of a molecular cloud where there is usually a lot of helium-3 present. In other words, it could not have formed somewhere on the outskirts or somewhere where there is not a lot of primordial gas. The high amounts of helium-3 present inside the core of our planet and the large amounts of it escaping from the surface suggest that the entire solar system and Earth inside the solar system were definitely somewhere in the center of this molecular cloud with large amounts of helium-3 present inside of it as well. And it was also most likely formed during an extremely active phase of this molecular cloud where a lot of stars and planets were being formed. So kind of like what we usually see in a very active molecular cloud nearby, such as the ones right here located in the Carina Nebula. And that of course sort of makes sense. But more importantly it shows us that our planet is one of those typical planets formed in these nebula, so we might find another one somewhere out there. But when it comes to helium-3 and its use for our future technologies, that's of course another question. We're still really really far from being able to create a practical fusion reactor, and we're still far from finding a source of helium-3 that can be easily obtained and can be then easily used for the types of fusion we need. But all of these ideas and all of these theories one day could produce some kind of a practical result. And so until we actually hear something else about fusion, or until something else comes out in regards to helium-3, that's all I wanted to mention. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining a channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.